distinguished ladies and gentlemen to introduce you a distinguished university professor, a professor of medicinal chemistry and pharmacology from the University of Maryland uh, School of Medicine. He is no other person than Professor Vincent Nja. two, three days notice and we are all here. I really, really appreciate all of us. And I want to say to the uh, guests and distinguished lecturer that ordinarily this place would have been packed full with academic staff and even non-academic staff who are desirous of knowledge 
Uh, unfortunately, many of them are not back yet. Um, one of us lost a wife. And while I was in church this morning, I saw a number of them who are also traveling, who are back, and they'll be traveling. So don't be discouraged that the, the hall is not uh, full. I assure you that next time you have anything to do with us and you come in, we may not even use this place. It will be too small. We may have to use our international conference center that will sit more than 3,000 people. We do use it and we get full capacity when we have lectures like this. So, dear colleagues, I welcome each and every one of you in Jesus' name. My dear principal officers of the university, let me recognize Professor Roland, who had to help to facilitate this program for us at the very short notice. And in particular, I want to again join um, our MC to recognize and welcome Professor Vincent Nja and his wife and all the Nja Danasis members that are here. I will welcome all of you and we thank you for um, supporting your son and allowing him and encouraging him to be with us. I must say here that we actually gave him like four or five days notice to be here. And uh, we really, really appreciate him for accepting to be here with us. And um, I thank a colleague who actually drew attention, the, the director of research, who drew attention to his being in the States, and that we should make use of this opportunity of inviting him to talk to us. Again, I thank you, Prof, for accepting to talk to us. So um, it is with a heart full of joy and humility that, again, I welcome all of you to 2024. The very first distinguished lecture that will be given by distinguished Professor Vincent Nja on a, on a topic that touches the heart and emotions of many of us here present. We don't want to listen to the big grammar there, but what I'm interested in is that the summary of all that grammar, uh, oncopharmacology, and all that is all about cancer, we are told. And we know all the story about cancer. Cancer today has become a major source of concern to virtually all of us in the society and a major source of mobility and mortality globally. And uh, I know that many of you and I have lost someone who so dear to us to cancer and then we know that the consequence of cancer is very disastrous know that by the day, the cases of cancer, prostate cancer, breast cancer, and all forms of cancers are increasing by the day in our society. And that is why when we heard about Prof's presence here, we decided to catch in and get him talk to us about his research work and particularly about what he's been doing uh, globally and internationally on uh, this issue that is affecting all of us. The principal thing about the university is the training and retraining of staff and students. Nobody can overemphasize the power of rejuvenating the mind academically. It is the propagating and enhancing of knowledge that a university is set up. And we continue to build our capacity in any form and that is why we as a university are set to initiate the university distinguished lecture series and we want to be bringing professors from all over the world to share their experiences and knowledge with us and to motivate us equally not to relent in our efforts in improving our education system we hope to have more of this a distinguished lecture series. We know that as a university, we have been having institutes, graduate schools, some faculties hold their distinguished guest lecture. But as a university of Calabar, we haven't actually set that up. And we want to start with this maiden edition of distinguished guest lecture. And Professor Nja has gone into history 
as our first distinguished guest lecturer. So we thank you so much, sir, for doing that for us. Today we have the opportunity of listening to a very distinguished professor, our own, and as Professor Ndomaiba uh, will be telling us, our own, who left us here, who went out, who saw, who acquired the knowledge and conquered in innovative education system. He excelled in the foreign land and in the environment, and most of all, is willing to share the secrets of his innovative education to help us improve on our lives and make progress in our own developmental efforts. He will share his journey in academics and unravel the mysteries of medicinal chemistry and oncopharmacology. Please, I just want to encourage us that we need to sit put. A number of people will be coming in late to join us, but please, let's sit put and encourage him by sitting down here to the end of the lecture. And I know that as we leave this place, we'll never be the same again in the area of the subject matter. Once more, I welcome each and every one of you and wish you again a happy 2024. Thank you. Thank you so much. Like I said earlier, can we give up in 2024 for your Thank you so much. With the best humility, may I now invite the person to take up the citation, and that is no other person than Professor Doma Roland Doma Eba. Please introduce a distinguished university. Thank you for having Thank you so much. My IPC members of the university management, our guest lecturer, and my very good friend and former classmate. Distinguished professors, heads of departments, invited guests, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. I count it a great privilege and honor indeed to be able to stand here to read the citation for my good friend, distinguished professor, distinguished university Professor Vincent Inja, who is also FNAI Fellow National Academy of Inventors of America. May you stand, please. Uh, in order not to turn the introduction to the main lecture, I shall endeavor to follow the type script that I have been given, because I suspect many who know me will think that I will spend the whole day reading this. <laughs> Professor Vincent Tinja was my classmate 53 years ago. And that happened because there was a civil war in Nigeria. And after the civil war, I went over to Marinor and Vincent was part of the class I joined. Luckily, our classmates in other fields have endeavored to be here also. Many have proven and achieved great successes in various fields, including the law, forestry, uh, the armed forces, and co. Uh, Professor Vincent Tinja completed his BSc in chemistry at the University of Ibadan. It is stated the top university in Nigeria. I think the thing is the first university in Nigeria. Yes. <laughs> 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 
I'm not a UIite. That's why I didn't say great UIite. <laughs> yes, he completed his BSc in 1976 and went on to obtain a PhD in organic chemistry in 1980 from University College, London University, under the supervision of Derek V. Banthor. Following two years of postdoctoral research with the late Eliahu Caspi at Worcester Foundation for Experimental Biology at Shrewsbury, Massachusetts, USA. Incidentally, that is the lab that invented the contraceptive pill for women. I say so because ultra left women say they should have invented for men. But that's the laboratory where he went to do his postdoctoral. He joined the Department of Chemistry at the University of Ibadan as lecturer too in October 1982. He was promoted through the ranks and became professor of organic chemistry in 1996. Professor Onja is the recipient of numerous awards, including the Fogarty International Fellowship Award, in 1966, 86, the Yamagiwa Yoshida Memorial International Cancer Award in 1989, Medical Research Council of Canada Award in 1990, International Cancer Technology Transfer Award in 1992, and Alexander von Humboldt Research Fellowship Award in 1994. The Humboldt Research Fellowship is in Germany, and if you add Germany to the names I have written, I've already read, you will see that he covered the world. During his tenure at the University of Ibadan, he was visiting professor at several institutions, including Johns Hopkins University, Baltimore, USA, University de Sherbrooke, Sherbrooke, Quebec, Canada, University of Southampton at Southampton, University of Saarland at Saarbrücken, Germany, following several research visits from 1996 to 1998, collaborating with the late Dr. Angela Brody at University of Maryland School of Medicine, Baltimore. Internationally renowned breast and prostate cancer researcher, he emigrated to the U.S. in 1999. He is currently professor of medicinal chemistry and pharmacology, department of pharmacology, and head medicinal chemistry section of Center for Biomolecular Therapeutics, University of Maryland School of Medicine, Baltimore. Now, University of Maryland started about 1856. Remember, UCTH St. Margaret started in 1897, so not too far. But 1890, it started in 1856. And only uh, a guest lecturer is among the five inaugural distinguished university professors. His main research interest in the, is in the design, synthesis, discovery, develop, and development of novel small molecules as therapeutics for the treatment of human cancers, particularly prostate, breast, and for me, the pancreas, and other diseases. Over several years, he has developed a comprehensive drug discovery and development program at the University of Maryland School of Medicine. His research group consists of two laboratories. His compounds, molecular modeling, lead identification, and lead optimization 
using modern synthetic medicinal assays uh, in chemistry methods. His cancer molecular biology and pharmacology laboratory has expertise and capability in assay development, molecular mechanistic studies, in vitro and in vivo pharmacokinetics, toxicity and anti-tumor and metastasis efficacy studies. In collaboration with Dr. Angela Brody, they invented a novel CYP17 inhibitor AR antagonist androgen receptor degrader, now named Galeterol, that advanced to pivotal phase three clinical trials in ARV7 positive metastatic castration resistant prostatic cancer patients. That is one of our greatest challenges in uh, castration resistant uh, prostatic cancers. Although the trial was unsuccessful, the Galeterone technology has been licensed to LTN Pharmaceuticals Incorporated Baltimore that is continuing to its clinical development and will soon initiate a global pivotal phase three study of Galeterone in metastatic castration resistant prostate cancer patients. The trial is programmed to start enrollment of patients in Jamaica during Q3, Q4, and has already started, actually, as I'm aware. Galeterone is in a phase two clinical trial in patients with metastatic pancreatic cancer. The next generation Galeterone analogs, NGGAs, are also in development. For the Rambas technology, Dr. Nja co-founded Isoprene Pharmaceuticals Incorporated that is developing the lead VNLG 152R for oncology indi indications. On September 7, 2021, IPI announced that the National Institute of Health awarded the company a $2 million small business innovation research. I think that demands a clap. When you <laughs> multiply that by the current exchange rate, you will see that the money will fill this hall. <laughs> this grant will support ongoing advanced preclinical studies intended to lead to the finding of an investigational new drug application with the U.S. Food and Drug Administration as a prelude to phase one clinical trials. Recently, Hot Therapeutics Incorporated executed a licensing agreement for VNLT 152R from IPR for treatment of uh, metallurgical diseases. Galeterone is commercially available as a unique research. Uh, current projects in the laboratory include development of next generation of galeterone and uh, other molecular targets impacted by these two classes of unique uh, small molecules, including ARV, ARV7 1 and 2. Professor Nja has published over 123 peer-reviewed articles <laughs> reviews and book chapters and is the lead inventor on 37 everything my village needs. <laughs> and more than 30 pending patents that have led to several highly productive licensing agreements at U uh, University of Maryland, Baltimore. On 85% of this, he is first 
or senior corresponding author. The impact of the research has a H index of 47. and has 19,499 citations. <laughs> that is as October 2021. <laughs> Professor Anja actively participates in several drug discovery and development grant review committees nationally and internationally. His research is currently supported by the U.S. National Institute of Health and the National Cancer Institute. He, his inventions and patents have been licensed to biotechnology companies, including Tokai Pharmaceutical, uh, IPI, uh, Baltimore, and Hope Therapeutics Incorporated. Indeed, the impact of Dr. Tonja's research and inventions patents were recently recognized by University of Maryland and Baltimore's president, Bruce M. Jarrell, MDFAS. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, I'm sure you would already have had enough to know whom a distinguished professor Vincent Sinja is. But the interesting thing is that professor, distinguished professor Vincent Sinja has distinguished himself not just as an erudite scholar, as an astute researcher, but is able to combine invention with business which many of us are unable to do. And that is why he was elected Entrepreneur of the Year 2022. I present to you distinguished Professor Vincent But it's not moving. Did you plug that stuff? Did you plug it? <laughs> okay, it's working here. Yeah. Oh, okay. Oh, there. Okay. I okay, I didn't know that. Okay. Yeah. Good morning, everybody. There's a mic here. It's not working. Uh, okay. Oh, okay. Mm, good morning, everybody. In and welcome to what I have been told is the first okay uni university with distinguished you know this lecture 
in University of Calabar. I briefly joked, I mean, with the Vice Chancellor, that I'm being used as a guinea pig. Okay, but I've been used, okay, as guinea pig exactly so rarely, so I'm used to that. Madam Vice Chancellor, Madam, Madam Vice Chancellor, the Deputy Vice Chancellors, Registrar, the Bursar of University of Calabar, professors, deans, okay, heads of departments, these ladies, you know, and gentlemen. I am this highly, you know, this honored, you know, to be asked, you know, to present the first distinguished, okay, lecture you know, here at Unicor. I am humbled and honored, I will say that. I am aware, I mean, of the mission of the university, the University of Calabar and other universities. And true, okay, this series, okay, that's of lectures, we are supposed to advance, you know, this knowledge and inform ourselves, I mean, of the developments that are going on. I would have loved, I mean, to compare, okay, this inaugural this lecture, I mean, to other lectures. However, I do not have the time to do so today. So, what I have decided to do is to go ahead and try to discuss, I mean, the research, okay, that my laboratory and my lab personnel have been involved the last, okay, maybe 25 years. In preparing, you know, this talk, I mean, I consider the fact that in the audience would have okay, that's medicinal chemists, oncopharmacologists, medical doctors, and others who are not very familiar with science research. So what I try to emulate is, okay, that's Einstein's, this dictum, which says you should make things as simple as possible, okay, but not simpler. And that's what I've done. Okay, I think that can go. I mean, I like using this. <laughs> yeah. No, it's okay. I'm safe. Yeah, okay. The point should be towards the No, 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 that's fine. Yeah. No, it will work. No, the point I'm, I'm pointing at the screen. Huh? Is that what? No, it can move. It can move. If you look at, okay, my title, okay, that's medicinal chemistry and drug discovery. Okay, that's ingenuity, you know, and serendipity, or is it the other way around? And as you would hear this during the talk, you would see, okay, that's a lot of that. And of course, we are in the university system, so you can call that, okay, this academic, okay, that drug discovery and development. Why is 
said I'm moving. Why is it I'm moving? Yeah, yeah. No, but even then, it's not moving. No, I don't think so. It's not moving. I don't need to point in that direction. It was moving before. It moved before. But it moved before. It's oh boy. No, it should, it should move 100 yards away. I think it's the battery. Probably the battery is down or something. So can I just read? So. Can I control the slide for you? It's, see, but, but, but you can see the points are works. Let me just control the slide. Uh, Ask Raymond to bring some batteries in my bag. I don't think it. Okay. What do we see? Some batteries. No. Maybe, uh, maybe, yeah. Yeah. You can bring my laptop. And, I thought I had these okay. batteries. Okay, so what do you do, Prof? Hmm? You can use your laptop while I'll be projecting from the screen. Okay. Are you okay with that? Just yeah, okay. Or okay. Tell him to advance. Yes. You will advance. Use your laptop. Yeah, but I'm, I'm wondering why it's not, it's not moving at all. No, but why don't you... But it was moving before. No, let this man go and come. laptop is here. Oh, why not bring your laptop? Is it not possible? No, the, the HDMI will not reach here. Okay. How about you change? You can do it also. Uh, you change for him. Yeah, we'll change for you. Tell him. Okay, why not do that? Announce, it, it, announce, it, 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 you would advance a lot. <laughs> oh my god. All right, okay. Hold it, hold it. Ah, so my ledge. Okay, so. Yeah. Uh, so my lecture, I mean, it's divided into two parts. In the first part, I will discuss, okay, that's prostate cancer. Okay, pancreatic cancer from pharmaceutical innovations where we talk about the rationale, okay, this development, I mean, of Galateron for prostate cancer. I'll give you the key summaries, and then I'll go ahead to, dis to discuss the current status of the research. Next slide. Next. Go ahead. In part two of my talk, I'll discuss Okay, that's breast cancer. Okay, that's the rationale for the development, I mean, of rhombus, these small molecules. And in breast cancer, I'm likely focusing, okay, that's on triple negative, this breast cancer. Okay, that's CNBC. In here, also, I'll discuss, okay, that's a summary of our lead compound, this VNLG, this 152. And then, the new analogs, okay, that deteriorated analogs of 152. And I will discuss briefly about, okay, that's isoprene for pharmaceuticals. It's working now. 
as so as required okay, by the University of Maryland, it is possible. I have to make okay these disclosures. Also Galateron originally called VN this one twenty four one. I mean you can guess what VN stands for. I mean, it was discovered in India. You can guess what VN, you know, stands for. I'll tell you a brief story. I mean, when we started developing this molecule, okay, that's a lawyer told me you should be defining what VN stands for. Because he said VN can stand for, okay, like very nice, very nice, and very negative. So for the audience, I tell you that VN stands for Vincent Nguyen. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so I'll just go on. Yes, I mean, these are the disclosures, okay, which I have to make in all my talks. You know, and also, I mean, uh, okay, this technology, okay, was licensed, okay, to talk, I, but it's, it's licensed now to LTN. And, I mean, the other molecules are also in development. So, this, okay, it's my collaborator, she's late now, okay, that's Angela Brody. Okay, and this was, okay, the signing ceremony of, I mean, the new, this license to LTN. Okay, that's the university president. That's the head of research and development. That's the president of LTN, and that's the CEO of LTN. All right, so we are here in the University of Calabar, I mean, in academia, and I do my research, I mean, in academia. So, when you consider the development of drugs from the university setting, I mean, some, okay, drug discoveries effort in academia are anything but or academic, and you would see why I'm saying that. So research is defined as a careful, I mean, a diligent search, and a studious, okay, inquiry of a, or examination. Very nice and this noble words. Okay, but academic is a horse of a different color. In its noun form, is described as a person who is very learned but inexperienced in practical matters. Adjectival form is having, okay, no practical or useful the significance. It's also, I mean, a synonym is, okay, this pendatic. Usually, when we say academic, it means it does not matter. So, ladies and gentlemen, Madam Vice Chancellor, if we follow, okay, this definition, I mean, of academic, it means we are all wasting our time here. Because usually, when we speak and say that's academic, you really mean, okay, that it doesn't matter. But, as you would listen, oops. But I was listening to my talk. I don't want to be okay associated with things that don't matter. And you would not all be sitting here for things that don't matter. In the next few slides, or in the slides of my talk today, you would see that what we do. I mean, academic, okay, that's drug discovery, does matter. 
in my lab, this slide shows the overall the design strategy. From the medicinal chemistry, organic chemistry lab, and we reiterate with our pharmacology lab going this back and forth. And the whole idea is that we actually want to move stuff okay, towards the clinic and new drugs. And in terms, I mean, of training students, of course, they would train in all these various areas. Overall, in drug discovery and development, as in most research, the, the preclinical studies, as we call them, you have, okay, that's a hypothesis. Okay, that's compound A would latch on this and would do this and disrupt the action. If that works, of course, you need funding to do this research. And you can do studies, you know, in cell culture. And after that, you go on to studies in the laboratory. When you have a lead compound, it goes on to the clinical trials. You have the phase one, the phase two, and the phase three. And if it goes through the phase three, it gets approved as a drug. Because I did not have the time, I mean, to discuss our whole project. I mean, I'll just summarize the ideas, okay, that we had. In any research that you do, you must start with an hypothesis. You must have a goal of what you want to do. So if you look at here now, I say, the goal of this research in prostate cancer okay, was to identify or discover specific C17 inhibitors, I mean, which will target, I mean, the disease. And the reason is because androgens would stimulate the growth, I mean, of prostate cancer. If you inhibit the key enzyme, okay, CYP17, I mean, that would reduce the androgen production and, of course, would regress, you know, the tumor. So, if you take, I mean, a prostate cancer tumor, I mean, the major sources of androgens, okay, that's from the testes, the adrenal gland, and of recent, we found out that the prostate cancer cells themselves are able to synthesize androgens. So if you look at the male organs here, I mean, it's the prostate, it's right there. It sits below, okay, that's the bladder, and it, and it surrounds, okay, that's the urethra. I mean, so Charles Higgins, okay, won the Nobel Prize in, okay, 1996 for his discovery of the treatment of prostate cancer. And his discovery, okay, was castration of the testes. <laughs> yes, that's the therapy. And, I mean, that's still the major therapy, if <laughs> you would note. So, our idea is this. So, this slide shows you that, that the androgen can be produced from the testes, from the adrenal gland, and also from the tumor itself. So, the idea is that even if you block, you know, that castration as shown here, I mean, you still have production from this organ, so that would not kill you. So our idea was, why not develop an inhibitor of an enzyme which would block the biosynthesis of androgens I mean, from all sources? And the key target was the CYP17 the enzyme. So this, okay, here shows the stages of the disease, prostate cancer. It starts out as, as a very small tumor it starts enlarging and all that. 
Okay, but what kills the patient is when it spreads to the other organs. Okay, that's metastasis. So our whole idea is that if we develop the CYP17 inhibitors, you will be able to inhibit the androgens, I mean, from all sources. I mean, so what happens if you inhibit the CYP17 enzyme? That's the key enzyme here. You get a down regulation, actually, of the androgens, you know, shown here. Okay, that's cholesterol of the... I mean, I like to point that out because in our societies, when you hear the word, okay, cholesterol, you said it's, I mean, something bad. So, from this slide, it tells you that if you don't have, okay, that's cholesterol, you will not have the male and the female sex hormones. The androgens are the male sex hormones, and the estrogens are the female sex hormones. So, if you don't have this cholesterol, you will not have the males and females. I mean, so cholesterol is not a bad thing. You need it. Okay, so these androgens, they act because they bind to some sites. Okay, that's the receptor. The androgen, this receptor. And the androgen receptor is made, I mean, chromosome X, originates from chromosome X, that's the gene. Okay, that's the full length androgen and, okay, the spliced variants. Remember, okay, during the COVID period, we started hearing of, okay, that's the variants. That happens also in other diseases. So you can see this is the full length androgen receptor, but you also have other splice variants which are important, I mean, driving, I mean, the disease. And how does this work? So the, um, the I mean, the male sex hormone, that's testosterone, gets converted, I mean, to dihydrotestosterone, shown in this reaction. It enters the cell, it binds the androgen receptor, the androgen receptor now dimerize and bind, I mean, to the DNA response element. And this would now stimulate the growth of the disease. I mean, so we know the mechanism and the whole idea of this is to inhibit androgens. In the design strategy of the, these inhibitors, we focus on the knowledge I mean, of the mechanism of the reaction that's from pregnant alone, I mean, or progesterone, it goes via these two steps. And the whole idea is that there's a cleavage actually of, you know, the side chain. I mean, so based, I mean, on our knowledge of how the enzyme works, we're now able to design molecules where, I mean, we've modified functional groups around this region. And the whole idea is that you would form a heme, a, 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 you would form a bond to the heme ion to inhibit the enzyme completely. In doing this, I mean, the chemistry was important, where we were able to discover Okay, that's a new reaction. The nucleophilic, okay, vinylic addition, elimination, the substitution reaction, I mean, of this molecule. And this happened, okay, serendipitously. I won't go all into details. Okay, but based on these reactions that we discovered, we're now able to make one of our lead inhibitors for CYP17 VN851. Okay, but that advanced, I mean, of course, to galateron, which is shown here. So you ask the same question again, is it, okay, this ingenuity, I mean, or serendipity, or is it the other way around? 
the synthesis of galactoron was discovered in my lab also, and it's shown here. And it's this particular synthesis that is used. It, it, it's the same synthesis, I mean, with some modifications used industrially for the manufacture of the skeleton. This slide here summarizes the in vivo work. So what you do is, once you discover a molecule, and you test it this in vitro and it's active. Of course, you want to test it in animal models. And for example, okay, that's a control, okay, where you don't treat the mice. You can see the tumors are growing very high. But I mean, with the treatment, you can see this is slowed down, but with a molecule, you can see, I mean, there was this regression. I mean, so that's what you see I mean, in, uh, in all these other graphs where we are looking at the inhibition, I mean, of tumor groups, as shown here. And what we showed was that in the studies we did, okay, that galacturone was more effective or efficacious, okay, than castration, okay, than castadex, and some known drugs you know, for prostate cancer. I mean, in summary, we were able I mean, to discover the center, I mean, an inhibitor of 617. But we also found out, okay, that galacturone does block the action of androgens and it causes, you know, its down regulation. And we also had mechanisms that don't involve, you know, the androgen, okay, this receptor. You know, moving forward from here, we now found, okay, that's a new molecular target. I mean, which I will discuss in the later part of my talk, where the molecule induces degradation of the MNK1 and 2. Yeah, yeah, okay. The degradation of MNK1 and 2, and then, of course, inhibits, okay, that's protein translation. As I say, I'll discuss that in my next slide. So what we did here, I mean, this slide is very important for the reason that when we started our research, the idea was just to develop inhibitors of CYP17. But we found out that these molecules that inhibit CYP17 also have other okay, activities which we desire. So in a sense, I mean, when you are doing science, you have a hypothesis, but you do not just close your eyes and just say, okay, this is my goal. I mean, that's the only thing that will happen. You can also have or you know, identify other important these molecular targets. As we speak now, all these targets here, where we induce the degradation of the androgen receptor, we induce the binding of androgens to the androgen receptor itself, we can also, okay, the protein translational complex, then important in almost, you know, all cancers. So again, is it your ingenuity or is it serendipity or is it the other way around? So I'll go quickly now to discuss the clinical trials with Galatron. So if you look at this plot, okay, that's a waterfall plot of the PSA. Okay, that's prostate okay, specific antigen. It's a marker, you know, prostate cancer. When you have prostate cancer, you, you can, you see this rising in your blood. I mean, you can access it through the blood. Okay, so this waterfall plot, a waterfall. So you take this point here, you know, as zero. You know, and when the patients, you know, are being treated, the ones, in which the PSA is reduced are shown here. And those who are not responding, you can see the PSA is going up. Okay, but as you can see in this phase one clinical trials, okay, that galacron seems to be quite effective uh, in the majority of you know, the patients. So in phase one clinical trials, the major goal is to look, okay, that's for safety. 
And in phase one clinical trials, you also try to define a dose, I mean, or doses that you would test in subsequent clinical trials. That phases two and three. So here, of course, we found out that, yes, yeah, so this, this is just a summary of the phase one study. And this was quite impressive to the FDA. In Angelateron, okay, was designated as a fast track, you know, molecule for development. You know, but if you look here, okay, the dose that was used, you know, was very high. So as you see in subsequent studies, we tried, you know, now in the next generation Galateron analogs to get better molecules. I mean, the phase two trial here, yeah, this slide is not very clear on my board. It's a trial in, okay, these four distinct populations, I mean, of patients, I mean, with prostate cancer. So this trial was designated ALMO, androgen receptor. Okay, that's modulator, it's optimized for response. And as you can see here, you had the different groups of patients. I mean, you also had the criteria you know, for the outcomes. This is another waterfall plot of patients treated. As I already mentioned, the ones you see below here, the patients in which the PSA, I mean, is reduced. And you can see that in the phase two clinical trials, which is much larger than the phase one, there was significant, you know, this response in patients. While we're doing this research, of course, we're keeping our eyes on, I mean, other similar drugs. Okay, that's abiraterone. Okay, that is Zytiga. Okay, has been approved for prostate cancer therapy. That inhibits the C17 enzyme. Uh, and and zolotamide, you know, that stands there, is another molecule which blocks the androgen receptor. That has also been approved for clinical trials. However, I mean, yeah, in the splice variants, okay, this molecule doesn't, uh, I mean, these molecules do not work. So, so we found out, remember I mentioned something about the splice variants, that, okay, that galaferon is able to degrade both the full length AR you know, and also the splice variants. So we believe that our molecule, Galateron, I mean, should be superior, I mean, to the currently approved therapies, I mean, for breast cancer. This study was quite important, okay, it made the cover page of the journal of, okay, that's medicinal chemistry. And this journal, I mean, it's supposed, it's supposed to be the most cited, this medicinal chemistry journal in the world. Okay, based on the studies discovered in my lab and the phase one and two clinical trials. Okay, that's Tokai Pharmaceutical set out to do a phase three, okay, this pivotal trial. I mean, they went back and looked at the phase two data and found out, okay, that six, okay, out of seven patients that express the Pfizer and androgen receptor okay, did respond, I mean, in terms of the PSA. Okay, this decreases. And then, I mean, this was a trial design. Okay, but the trial was unsuccessful. That's the phase three. It's outside the phase three that you now approach the FDA for approval. So you ask the question, why did Galateron fail in phase three clinical trials? I mean, we strongly believe, okay, that it was a flawed design of the trial. I showed you, I mean, some two approved drugs. And you can see the number of patients that they had in their phase three clinical trials, the pivotal phases. And you can see the number of patients that talk I had with Galateron. So we strongly believe that it was a flaw in the design. Okay, but another curious 
this finding with the company was that during the design of the phase two, I mean, all the top people in the company, okay, were selling their stocks. So uh, I'll just highlight this. So you can see the CEO, the CFO, the CEO, I mean, we're all selling their stocks during the phase two design. So, I mean, there's a caveat there. This slide just summarizes what I've talked about, how these molecules are able to inhibit the growth of prostate cancer, including those that express the ARV7. And the question is, what do we do next? I mean, the recommendation comes in the next few slides where, I mean, we are planning, of course, I mean, for new clinical trials. Yeah, okay, so this slide shows the students and postdocs who worked on this project throughout the time. I mean, one of, okay, my former postdocs was just appointed, okay, that's the dean of Okay, the Pharmacy School of University of Maryland is in show last year. <laughs> so, in the next couple of slides, I will discuss the plans to rescue galateron therapy for prostate cancer. And also, I'd like to discuss, I mean, some new studies that we are doing, I mean, pancreatic cancer phase two clinical trials. So we have, okay, that's enough tablets actually to initiate another phase three clinical trials. I mean, I mean again, you have seen this photograph for the, for the licensing to LTN. I mean, so LTN now plans to start new clinical trials. They would start out, okay, that's in the Caribbean. Okay, that's the PI, Aris Hussein, is in our cancer center. He would manage these trials. Okay, and Jamaica has the highest, okay, that's mortality of, okay, prostate cancer, as you would see here on this slide. I mean, that's mortality, and these are the incidences, and you can see Jamaica has the highest rate. So in fact, the founder of LTN, okay, that's Dr. Lowe, he's from Jamaica. So that's why the new trial would start there. And this is, I mean, the announcement for the new clinical trials by LTN. I mean, these are the clinical trials criteria. And there are also plans to conduct clinical trials, okay, that's in Nigeria and other African countries. We, as I will discuss in, in some slides ahead, we have discovered, I mean, some new salt analogs of Galateron, which are better than the parent Galateron, 9.7 fold beta. I mean, so clinical trials, this would be a phase two trial now to compare, okay, that's the salt with the parent compound. This trial should start soon. However, I mean, based on what I have discussed, okay, that's Galateron and the related compounds or analogs do also have you know, other molecular targets. I mentioned, okay, that's the MNK1 and 2 EIF4E. And it turns out that MNK EIF4E is upregulated, okay, that's in pancreatic cancer. So if you look at this pathway, the RASMEC pathway would converge here at protein translational complex. And what we are doing is actually to plot this. And in clinical trials, it shows that, I mean, the patients who have, okay, that's low levels of EIF4E have, okay, that's the best prognosis, while those that have the high, 
levels of AIF or a health, you know, is a very poor prognosis. So that's why we uh, we were initiating. Okay, that's a new trial for prostate cancer. This just gives the history, which I will just skip. And then here, this summarizes. Okay, that's what we found out with these molecules. I mean, pancreatic cancer models. They inhibit the cell viability. They induce, okay, that cell death. I mean, there's down regulation of MNK, phosphor, EIF, FOIA, NF, kappa B. EZH and e heartcarin is upregulated, and those are implicated in EMT transition. And we published a manuscript where we showed okay, that galacron would synergize, I mean, with gemcitabine to inhibit the growth of prostate cancer. So, what was the significance and implication of this? Okay, the current drugs use okay, for pancreatic cancer, okay, gemcitabine. You know, and then the combination of four drugs, fluorofuninate, and then gemcitabine, you know, paclitaxel. And it turns out that our molecules, that galacteron is able to impact on this. To the former director of our cancer center, okay, that's Kevin Cullen, based on the results from my lab, he now decided to fund, okay, that's internally, okay, that's the phase two clinical trials in pancreatic cancer. Remember, I mean, this molecule was originally designed Okay, that's for prostate cancer, but we found out that it's also effective in pancreatic cancer. So, we, we now have a clinical trial ongoing at our comprehensive cancer center in Maryland. And if you Google, if, if you Google this information, I mean this link, you, you would know more about the clinical trial. These are the investigators and co-investigators and the lead peer of the study is Dr. Jian. In terms of, okay, that's perspectives. If you compare the incidence, okay, and mortality, you know, prostate cancer, okay, the mortality is just 12% if you compare them to the incidence. But in pancreatic cancer, you can see if you compare, okay, the mortality to the incidence, that's very hard. So, I mean, we, we strongly believe, okay, that we're in the right part to conduct a phase two clinical trials. I mean, so the phase two clinical trials, this began during, you know, the pandemic, okay, that's the COVID, you know, pandemic. So, Okay, the recruitment, you know, was very low. Okay, but a couple of months ago, August 4th, it's 2023, we received some good news, I mean, from Dr. Jiang. This is an expand, um, enlargement of her email. I would like to share Okay, that's a good news with everyone. And the good news is, there was a first patient who has pancreatic cancer, advanced pancreatic cancer. This patient has failed all the frontline therapy, but it did respond, partial response to galateron. This was a couple of months ago. So we are now okay, going to expand okay, the clinical trial, I mean, to other centers. We already have, okay, that's the budgets. 
I mean, to expand the trial to four, to four different cancer centers. Okay, but our can, uh, okay, but Dr. Kulman is very enthusiastic. He wants to do, I mean, to continue an internal trial. Okay, that's with 20 patients. You know, and there is, okay, that's the costing. So we're very, okay, this excited. I mean, this technology again, I mean, has been licensed. I mean, to, okay, that's to isoprene pharmaceuticals, which I will talk about. And we are also planning to apply for an SBIR director phase two small business grant. I mean, to conduct, okay, that's a clinical trials. We, although we have Galateron, which is now in clinical trials, I mean, we, we have not rested our hours. So in the next few slides, I will just give you the, the development that we have for Okay, that's the next generation is Galateron analogs. We have an NIH, this five-year grant that is supporting our research. We also got, I mean, some supplemental, you know, research for this work. So, what is the justification for the next generation of Galateron analogs? Remember I told you I mean, the daily dose that is currently used in the clinic is very high. So the idea would be that if we're able to develop some new analogs of this Galateron, we might increase the anti-cancer potency, improve okay, the pharmacokinetic properties, improve, of course, okay, the dosing that you give, and that's less toxicity. Remember, I mean, any drug you take into your system would always have, I mean, some side effects. Okay, but the less amount of drug you give, I mean, the better. So the idea now is to try to reduce the effective dose of Galateron. So here, I mean, we did a systematic study, you know, and found out, okay, that modifications I mean, of this lead molecule, Galateron, at the, the, A, uh, the A side chain is, okay, that's beneficial. And we went ahead, I mean, to design and synthesize some new molecules. Okay, the lead compounds are the VN414 and the VN is 433. But again, here, I mean, the yields, the initial yields of these compounds are quite low, about 11%. So how do we improve on that? We have been able to do that where we increase the yields by about six-fold for each compound. The few slides, I mean, just shows the chemistry, which I'm not going to discuss in detail. Uh, we have patterns, okay, covering this new synthesis. So the next thing we did quickly after we identified two, two new next generation galanox was to do the pharmacokinetics in mice. And you can see here, this is the PKF profile, I mean of Galateron. This given IV, IP, and oral. And this is for the new lead compound. And you can see the profile is quite different. I would highlight the VNPP433 beta. We increase the half-life okay, by 25 times, the oral bioavailability by three times, the CMAX by 22 times, and the area under the curve, that's the area under the curve of these lines, that was increased enormously. So, I'll just summarize the data here because I do not have the time to go. This is all you know, it's published. Uh, so the hydrochloride salts, I mean, was something that just came in this field and it's very it's exciting. So in fact, I mean, with most drugs that we take, we, they are in what you call the salts forms. 
and the thought forms, the idea is that they will be able to get Oculus into the system much more easily you know, and retain. And we exploit Okay, that's the HCLs for the hydrochloride salts. Okay, I'll just. We went for the hydrochloride salts because if you review the approved drugs, this currently, okay, the hydrochloride salts are the most. And for most cancer drugs, actually, it's the hydrochloride salts that are currently being used. So I'll just keep this quickly. This is, okay, that's the in vitro studies yeah. oh, in prostate cancer cell lines. Let me just highlight this. So the prostate cancer cell lines, okay, that's most of them are developed from white people. There are very few that have been developed, I mean, from blacks. Okay, so one of the essence now is if you want to develop any new molecule, you should try to show that it's effective in both the cell lines, this derives that's from white patients, and the cell lines derive okay, that's from black patients also. So if you look at, I mean, these three cell lines are from white patients, while these two are from black patients. Okay, and the summary I'll just give you is that uh, our molecules are effective against all prostate cancer cell lines that we have, the major ones, irrespective of ancestry. So it means that these molecules Okay, can be developed and be used also by us. These are the molecular markers, which I would just go quickly for the sake of time. And I'll just go to discuss the in vivo studies. Okay, remember, I mean, you can make a molecule, okay, you test it. I mean, cell culture, that's great. The next, okay, pivotal part is that you have to show that it works in animals first. And it's only after these molecules work in animals, then, I mean, they can now be moved, I mean, to humans. If you don't have data showing that they work in animals, I mean, you can make the best molecule and say it inhibits the growth of cells, but if it does not in inhibit the tumors themselves, or, okay, that's metastasis, then that's a waste of time. So, uh, we were this excited, I mean, when we made the cells of Galateron and the 433, okay, and we did a pilot study just comparing them. That's the control is not treated. Okay, but you can see that with the salts, I mean, they're quite effective. These are, I mean, the excised tumors. So you normally grow these tumors, okay, that's under the skin of, you know, the mice. I mean, that's the control. You can see how large they are, but the ones that are treated, you can see that there's reduced size in the tumor. So we did this. And an important thing in animal models is you look at, okay, that's what the drug, the, the drug does or the molecules do. Okay, that's the body weights of the mice. This would tell you whether these molecules, okay, are toxic. I mean, if they lose weight, you know, while you are doing the animal studies, then that tells you that the molecules are toxic. But as you can see here, uh, look at that, the control and all the treated groups, there's no the significant change in their body weights.
Okay, so the next thing we did, I mean, you want to compare the molecules you are developing, I mean, with approved drugs, you know, because that's a competition that you would face. So here, I mean, we did a clinical trials with our new molecules, and we compared them with FDA-approved drugs, okay, that's enzalutamide and docetaxel. These drugs, okay, are blockbuster drugs, you know, currently. So you can see again, okay, that's a tumor volume with our molecules. That is very comparable with the tumor weights as shown here. This, okay, so what are four plots? You, you can see two groups here of galateron, there's regression of, of tumor. So you take where you started at zero, you know, and after the treatment, you measure the volumes, and you can see there's two more regression with these two doses. This compared to FDA approved drugs. This again shows, okay, that the waterfall plots of individual mice and tumors, and this again, the body weight. Same thing with, I mean, the 433 also. The salts are very effective, they cause okay, that's two more regressions and are better than the FDA approved drugs. These are the sizes of the tumors at the end of the study. That's the control, no treatment, treated with vehicle. These are treated with FDA approved drugs, and these other groups are treated with our the molecules. And you can see clearly, just eyeballing them, our molecules are better than FDA approved So, an important thing also in, in drug discovery when you test your drugs, you have an idea, I mean, of the target. So you ask yourself, what are these molecules doing to the molecular targets that you are interested? So, so this slide, here shows, okay, that's the Western blotting of all the different proteins. Okay, that's the control. Those are, those are approved drugs. And, and if you look around this region, you can see that there's a significant depletion of the molecular targets. So it tells you that there's target engagement of these molecules. Again, the summary, these drugs inhibit, they are better than two or three FDA approved drugs that we have tested against. So we now have the salts, we have applied for new patterns to protect them, and we are going on. I will just keep this slide. Okay, so this is an important slide. So when you discover some new molecules and you want to develop them, you have to protect them, and that's why you have to apply for, okay, that's patterns to protect them. Because if you do not, okay, the pharmaceutical companies would not be interested, I mean, in developing, I mean, your molecules. So we are lucky that uh, our university is quite, okay, that's aggressive in applying for, okay, the Spartans. Okay, so these are the students, you know, and postdocs who have been involved in this research program for the next generation Galatron analogs. So I go now to the final part of my talk, which involves, okay, that breast cancer. So I talked, okay, about prostate cancer. I mean, that is a disease that affects, okay, just men. Okay, the pancreatic cancer affects both male and female. Okay, so let me ask you, what about breast cancer? I mean, whom does it affect? Is it boats? Yes. Okay, yes, you guys are very, <laughs> you are very knowledgeable. <laughs> Clap for yourself. 
is, is it, I mean, the reason why I asked this question was, okay, this earlier on, you know, in my career, when I talked, you know, this breast cancer, you know, most people, because, um, at the bottom, I would say, they just thought, okay, that breast cancer, I mean, just affects women. No. As you can see in the statistics, uh, I'll show you something. We men also have breasts, so we can have this breast cancer. Okay, but the women have it more than we do, so that's, that's the point. All right, so here, I mean, I'll just go quickly to with these molecules. I mean, it, it's, it's all an interesting story, and I hope you bear with me. So, you all should be familiar, okay, with, uh, with retinoic acid. Okay, with carrots. I know you must have heard some stories that if you don't want issues with your eyes, I mean, you should eat carrots and things like that. It's, I mean, it's fairly true. So, this here is all transretinoic acid. That's the structure. It's derived, I mean, of course, I mean, from plant sources. Okay, that's beta carotene. And you actually just get a cleavage actually of this chain here. Okay, an oxidation, and you get all transretinoic acid. Okay. And although it's involved with the way, I mean, we see as humans or animals. So I have, okay, so there's a joke I normally do sometimes. Uh, what do you guys see at this end? Okay, that's a yellow pointer, right? Okay, and all of you can see it. Because all of you can see, I, I mean, sorry, the green pointer, I can say 100 and 200% that you all have all transretinoic acids in your system. Because if you don't have all transretinoic acids, uh, or, I mean, the alcohol form. I mean, I mean, we get. Oops. Uh, sorry. Uh, uh, we get metabolized to the as. I mean, all transferric acid. You will not be able to see. I mean, your mechanism of this vision has to do with, okay, that's when like, okay, strikes, I mean, one of these double bonds, there is a conformational change, and that conformational change would now send, okay, that signals to your brain, and that's how you are able to see. So, you agree with me that all of us have, okay, that's all transatinoic acids in our bodies. Okay, so it's been shown that, you know, this molecule is not just important for, for vision, okay, and skin diseases. So in fact, oh, okay, it's talking about all transatinoic acid. Okay, for most of you who, okay, who bleach, let's put it that way. This is an important ingredient. I mean, the retinol compound. So they are used, you know, also for dermatological, you know, issues. However, they are also, they have, okay, they are approved. All trans acid is approved for, okay, that's APL. Acute, okay, that's myelocytic leukemia, APL. So this, this is, as far as I know, okay, the first, okay, anti-cancer drug, okay, that cured APL in some patients, this here, I mean, after treatment, 
okay, for 60 days. It cured, okay, that's a number of patients, and it's still, okay, an approved drug, APL, for APL. And it's also been shown that it's involved, okay, that's in breast, okay, and in prostate cancers. So I just have this slide. Let I me mean, to give the statistics. So, however, I mean, there is a problem, I mean, with the clinical failure of all transrepinoic acid in cancer therapy. So, it's been shown that ATRA would, okay, get okay, that metabolites by an enzyme called the C26. So this 4-hydroxy atra, okay, and this mopolar, this compounds. Okay, these metabolites are not as effective, you know, as a parent, this compound. Uh, what are the implications? It means, of course, that if you are, if you are, if you are treating a patient with atra, you may have to increase the dose. And if you increase the dose, of course, I mean, there could be, okay, these complications. But our, we had this idea. Oops, sorry. We had this idea that because we know, okay, this major mechanism, I mean, of drug resistance with ATRA, why not design some molecules that would inhibit this key enzyme involved in that hydroxylation? So what could happen is that you could give ATRA and the inhibitor okay, that to prolong its effects, or you could just give the drug that, that inhibits the CYP17. And because, I mean, we do have, look okay, at that intracellular ATRA, I mean, that might be enough actually for the therapy. I mean, that's where we... Oh, we started again, as with the CYP17 inhibitors. I mean, the design of our inhibitors was based, I mean, on the knowledge, I mean, of the metabolism. Remember, I showed you that the metabolism occurs in this region. So it makes sense that if you take a similar molecule, or can modify it with a functional group, that can bind to the heme ion of the enzyme system, you will be able to inhibit the enzyme. And that's exactly what we did here. This I mean, is a reaction where we're able to synthesize a molecule with an imidazole grouping at C4. And we start with all transatinoic acid. I'm not going to go into the details, but no, okay, but the key reaction was here, where we went from the hydroxy to introduction of this group. I mean, such reactions, typically, if you show them, I mean, to an organic chemist, they will tell you this reaction will not go because of, okay, this allylic nature of the hydroxy group. But we were able to get that reaction to go. So, in this case also, I mean, we went ahead, I mean, to make molecules. This slide here shows some of the lead molecules that we have. And we found out that in addition to inhibition of the CYP17, I mean, CYP26 enzyme, these molecules are also able to eat, uh, I mean, to antagonize the androgen receptor, and importantly, they also impact on the MNK EIF4E pathway. I mean, which I would explain in the next few slides. So here, what we show, these two pathways, the ras mec pathway, they are upregulated, okay, that's it, most diseases. And they all impact Okay, here on the proton translational complex. So when this is upregulated, all you need to do is to inhibit the activity of you know, this complex. And in that case, 
you would inhibit most oncogenic you know these targets say for example look at the eif for mnk they are involved in cell proliferation they are involved in invasiveness they are involved in cell that apoptosis so the idea is that we are just trying to inhibit those actions also. However, I'm sure there are some people in the audience asking, why won't inhibition of EIF4E or eif 4 complex or eif 4 kill all the cells and not just the cancer cells? Why? The answer is simple. Remember, to make the oncogenes, your cells need to make first, okay, the mRNAs. Remember, okay, that during the COVID, we're hearing a lot about mRNAs. They are the ones that make the oncogenes. So, and you have the mRNAs. Okay, let me just go. You have... Okay, that's two major types of mRNAs. You have what you call the strong mRNAs. And these mRNAs are the ones that would make, okay, that's, okay, that's the proteins in our body, how our cells would develop and all that. Beta actin is a typical example. Okay, it's okay. Okay, this guy DH a typical one. So those are classified as the strong mRNAs. You then have what you call the weak mRNAs. And most of these would, uh, okay, like cyclin D1, you know, and others are, okay, this oncogenic. So just consider in our bodies, these strong mRNAs are, okay, that's well translated. I mean, when you have, okay, that's limiting EIF4E. They are very well translated. Unlike the weak mRNAs, they are only translated when the EIF4E is okay, this upregulated or increased. And they have been shown to be involved in the inhibition of cell proliferation. If you inhibit this, to suppress tumor-related angiogenesis, uh, you know, replace, okay, that's metastasis and so on and so forth. And these are, Okay, the molecular targets, okay, which we look out for, the cyclin D1, the NIC, the o ODC, the BCL2, VEGF, and so on. So when you reduce the impact of EIF4E, it would have a minimal effect on the total protein synthesis, and therefore it will have a minimal effect on the normal cells. So that's why you can inhibit um, the protein translator complex. Okay, so this slide also shows it in a different, in a different perspective. If you plot the rate, I mean, of, okay, that's protein synthesis, I mean, in normal growth and in cancer, you can see here where the EIF4E is limiting. You see here it's bound to the bounding protein. Okay, that's a normal scenario. Okay, the housekeeping genes, you know, the beta catenin, they have reached a plateau, actually, here. Okay, but in cancer, there is an increase, of course, of EIF4E. There is phosphorylation of the binding protein, I mean, which releases EIF4E. So you have a lot of EIF4E available, and those would now go, I mean, to bind and form the EIF4X complex. And they get phosphorylated by MNK and their own cogenic. 
So what happens is that if you have this situation in cancer and in metastasis, all you need to do is to reduce the level of this complex, say it to a point like this, and it will not affect the proliferation of um, the normal cells. So quickly, I said I will discuss this breast cancer, and I'll focus, I mean, on triple, triple, okay, and quadruple, yes, this breast cancer, triple negative breast cancer. Okay, we talked about this before. Okay, it's known that one in eight women would get this breast cancer in their lifetime. I mean, there are three major types, and these two have their therapies, but the triple negative breast cancer, I mean, does not yet have an approved this prostate cancer therapy. And here it's shown that the EIF4E is also upregulated in these cancers. And you have another cancer which lacks the androgen receptor, which has now been shown also to be important. Okay, that's in breast cancer. In breast cancer. So, as I said, this man can also have, can have breast cancers too. And that consists of about 2% of all breast cancers. I will just go quickly for the sake of time. I mean, this set of molecules also we found out do inhibit the MNK, EI, F4E, this pathway. I will show you some in vivo studies again, where you see the mice with the tumors, and then you can inhibit them. And we look at the body weights and also the molecular markers for toxicity. And in the end, you look at the target engagement from the tumors that you excise. You can see they are downregulated. But um, apoptosis, that cell that is upregulated. I mean, we showed this, I mean, in different, oh, okay, that's models. And if you look at this, for example, in this group, I mean, some tumors are actually, okay, disappearing. This is a study, I mean, from a cancer cell that was obtained, I mean, from a patient in our cancer center hospital. And we're able to grow that in the laboratory to form tumors, and we tested uh, our molecules, and as you can see again, they are able to inhibit the growth. I mean, of what of what you call the PDX, you know, the, these models. I had mentioned, okay, that what kills the patient, I mean, is the metastasis. We also looked out to see whether our molecules do inhibit, okay, metastasis. We can indeed they do. So if you look at this group here, in 14 days, there is. Okay, this massive, okay, that's metastasis from the tail vein to the lungs. But in the group we treated with our molecule, it was just one of the mice in this five that had that metastasis. So our molecules are also able to inhibit this metastasis. I'll skip these slides and just show you some uh, uh, in vivo data. Okay. So here we made, we're always trying to improve things. That's the parent compound. We made some new analogs of this molecule, of this molecule shown here. And as you can see, th these tumors are from. Okay, that's a white patient. Okay, that's a Caucasian American. You can see that our molecules are able to inhibit. This here is from a black patient, this, this cancer model, the 468. And you can see that's our parent compound, but the newer molecules are improved as compared to the, 
again, I mean, we show that here when we compare it with FDA approved drugs. And uh, our molecules, you know, are better than FDA approved drugs. This is the waterfall plot. Again, I mean, we have patterns to protect our, these molecules. These are postdocs and students who worked on this project. So, usually, we have discussed this. You have inventions and you have inventions. So, what do you do with them? I mean, the universities all over the world and in America are selling, okay, it's faculty that you don't just do, okay, that's the academics. I mean, you have to be involved, okay, that's in trying to translate, okay, your yeah, research. So, I, okay, was able to collaborate with our university and we formed it's a small business entity. Okay, that's Isoprene, okay, pharmaceuticals. We formed a small company. I'm the president, and you have others who work for the university who serve in the company. So, I mean, we got, we received um, an SBIR grant. You know, we are working with a company, okay, that doubles pharmaceuticals, I mean, to develop our molecule. Okay, Roland Ndamegwa did mention, okay, this award, this entrepreneur of the year. I mean, this, um, okay, this lecture, I believe, is still on, online. So if you want to listen to it, you can go ahead and listen to it. And then I'll just acknowledge, uh, okay, that's our former dean, okay, that dean race. I mean, he was dean of the School of Medicine for 16 years. I mean, he actually just stepped down about a year ago. Uh, he's from Jamaica originally. Then, you know, of course, to get Entrepreneur of the Year, I mean, you have to have, okay, that's recommendations. These are those who recommended me. Okay, and internally, of course, you have to have, okay, that's recommendations. Um, that's our chair. Okay, that's Peg McCarthy. Okay, that's the former dean of our cancer center. He stepped down at the end of this year. Okay, but there's some good news. Guess what? Okay, the new dean of our cancer center is a Nigerian. <laughs> the new director, sorry, of our comprehensive cancer center is a Nigerian. Uh, he actually sent me an email, okay, yesterday, after, I mean, he resumed, you know, on January 1, and he's asking, I mean, to meet with me for about 30 minutes. I've actually responded, you know, so I'll have a meeting as soon as I go back. Okay. Okay, this, okay, is Bruce Gerald. Okay, that's our university president. In terms of here in Nigeria, that's our vice chancellor. We call them the university president. So he is the awarder of, I mean, the entrepreneur of the year. Okay, other announcements. Of course, my wife is here. Okay, okay and our son is in Abuja. She's not here. <laughs> These are the founders of our research. NIH and a number of other companies. I'd like to thank all of you.
and I would like to answer any questions. Uh, but let me warn the audience. So, uh, from my experience, I've seen, I mean, I've seen some speakers. I mean, when they finish, I mean, presenting their talk, they don't like, oh, okay, like difficult questions. So, I mean, there, were, there was one speaker. Okay, who reminded the audience that he has, okay, that's a pointer. And if you ask him a difficult question, he's going to blind you with the pointer. <laughs> so, uh, uh, if you don't want to be blinded, don't ask a difficult question. Huh? Okay. Five? Uh, okay, five questions. Excuse me. Um, oh, okay. Here. Last questions. Okay. Yeah. I should hope I don't come. Thank you. I, I didn't think we acknowledge the excellent collection of our lecture. I think we should say that. I should say that. I think maybe I should just come. Yeah. I know how difficult it's going to be for you to ask questions. And in fact, his visibility is so magnified that he has shown himself more visible. I'm not sure you are going to do that. My listener, or as I would prefer, my president. Oh, okay, and now. <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> As we would unveil the awaited 2024 criteria or conditions of service, you notice that we have included that to get to the professorial round, if you have a patent, it makes it not to be easy. Here we have an embodiment of patent that we need to get out of time. And uh, although it is difficult to ask our scholars questions, let me just give a pipeline information on what he has said. He's talked about three distinct molecules, galactoron, Ramba, and then the VLR. I think one five two hours. Yeah, and the B is related to the Yeah. And the other B is to give it cancer cells. Essentially, the growth or metastasis of cancer. Okay, thanks. He's gone ahead to give us the molecular basis of the action. Yeah, Essentially, 
they treat oneself by not giving them what they want. Usually, in fact, from what we have displayed, those commodities which target key molecular proteins, which we call enzymes. We normally say enzymes are like some cellular machines that break things up. So when you inhibit an enzyme, something does not happen. See, they need a molecule to be transformed from one half of the group, or a molecule not be transformed or something else does happen. And the normal result is not found. So it is very interesting. Okay. I know, I know, like I said, the question will be how do we get there? So my first request, because I am moderating, is to please make a request on behalf of the University of Canada through the DEC's office, the DEC Research Collaborations and Linkages, to establish a collaboration between the University of Canada. And your center for biomolecular therapeutics research. That I'm sure will serve as the basis for further growth. It will enable us to interact with you, invite you to tell us who, send your students to be your group, give us opportunities to visit your lab, and equally bring our own material. Because truly, like you know how to say, all the atom soup and vegetable we are eating are not grown up. This is when he was talking and was talking about the transverse or in acid, all of us eat carrots every day. We eat pamphlets every day. Our great grandfather said, they never had to this time. Ever since we started going to visit the fish and the carrots, we started manifesting this. It is possible that the secret is that then from what our grandfather can we revisit those molecules? Even though we uh, abuse of our herbalists and all that, if you're from the visit, they are trying to collect our food with the first place of men and put on the less form. That's what we talk about regrowing the rest. It means we may have very potent anti cancer agents within our flora and fauna. And it is possible that we exploit this opportunity to see how we can put the University of Canada on the map of all patents that can be sold to pharmaceutical companies and of course you know what results we get. We will increase our energy and we will ultimately increase our visibility and we will be serving humanity. Please give a round of applause. We will want to invite. I don't know how many questions he can take. I think he said five. He has not commented on this. Okay, okay. Uh, I, I didn't think we needed to comment. I thought it was socially in the event. Okay. That, that, that should be Maybe part of We will give Professor Zia a little time to talk about what a few things I yeah. have requested for. Okay. And then we will take a few questions from our very, uh, very of our attentive audience. All right, thank you. All right, so I've heard from you. I mean, your request is okay. That's thoughtful and it's rational and. I mean, I clearly expected, I mean, this kind of a request to come up after my presentation. So, of course, uh, what I'll promise you is that okay, that's based. I mean, of course, on this discussion, I will put our heads together. Okay, that's with my colleagues when I go back. Okay, to so Maryland. 
how can bring up I mean this discussion you know and requests and or the VC would hear from me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. If they didn't understand the times, he found that he would put it through the process. Thank you, Rosanda. Thank you. And then how we make it more than one by one. So we are going to take a couple of questions. I think, uh, let me give numbers. Yes, let me give numbers so that we don't overwhelm it. Number one is the dean of pharmacy. Number two is Professor Hussein. Number three. <laughs> there are too many professors. <laughs> I don't want to lose my point. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. In the, I'm speaking on behalf of our faculty, faculty of pharmacy. We have a new faculty of pharmacy. A new building is going on. And uh, we are recruiting young researchers. Uh, how will you be able to help us? Because pharmaceutical chemistry is a core subject, a core department in the faculty of pharmacy. We also have a research laboratory where we'll be training our uh, postgraduate uh, students, that is masters and PhDs in the new building. It's a request soliciting for uh, linkages. We will discuss with uh, the DVC linkages for more assistance from you. I want to add this. Sir, how do you administer your drug? And, uh, your drug of bomba, how do you administer it? Is that they call? Oh, okay. Okay. Oh, to the right. Oh, to the right. Yeah. Okay, thank you. I think it's better we take all the questions. Oh, really? And then, and then I will ask. Okay. No, I'm noting them. But you, you are noting them. Okay, all right, good. Okay, yes, yeah, yeah, okay, all right. <laughs> Oh, Simo. <laughs> <laughs> Madam VC, thank you very much for this opportunity. And Vin, let me especially thank you. Uh, some of you don't know that Vin is from this state. And this is not the first time he has come to give us a public lecture. The first time he came, I was the anchor man. I did the job of, uh, that uh, Professor Dugaba is doing today. And he talked to us under the visitorship of uh, what, Professor Ivare Su. Ivare Su on this same cancer, but now it's making a lot of progress. Uh, Professor Anja, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, for remembering that you have to come to your state, always remember us. I know after this you will go to Ibadan to give this lecture, uh, where two of us graduated from. We also graduated from University College London, and we went back to Ibadan, stayed a few years, and left to uh, USA, and he's been there for a long time. Uh, Professor Eyong, please let me just plead with you. The VC is listening. 
let's not add patents as one of the young things for me because being a professor yes. here. <laughs> because you will not have professors. Some years you will not have one professor. I'm in charge of uh, IPTTO. We only have four patents. Only four. But there are a number of patents being considered. So, shift it to when somebody wants to become Professor Emeritus. Yes, that one make it more stringent. But if you put it for professorship, you'll be disappointed. Madam, you are here me. Okay. Now, there's one point you mentioned, which will lead to my question. Many of the things we eat in Africa, especially in Nigeria, are therapeutic. Many of our consumables are therapeutic. That is why our forefathers live longer than us. So I'm not surprised that uh, Professor Onja is telling us what he's telling us. We have found a few things that are therapeutic that improve the memory in small animals like mice, of which we got patents for it. And we want to do clinical trials. And my question now is, Professor Onja. Ah. Huh? No, okay, okay. Yeah, he's no, no, my he's question not now is that if you want to do clinical trials, I heard him say clinical phase one, phase two, how many phases? We'll get three. Oh, we'll get our, our uh, whatever we are trying to uh, sell to the public into the market. And this phase one, phase two, phase three, what do they involve? That's my question. Thank you very much. Thank you for listening. Okay, I think the next is Professor Abamu. Uh, good day, everybody. I want to thank. I want to thank uh, Professor Anja. I remember that I attended the lecture he gave us here a number of years ago. And see him once again reminds me of uh, one of our former professors of theoretical biochemistry in this university, Lassisi. I think he was in the college. Akin Tom, yes, professor of theoretical biochemistry. So I remember that immediately he said that one of the ways of also looking at this issue is uh, it doesn't matter because it's academic. And uh, I have learned that. Then I got to hear, I think I will go home happier than I, when I came, because some of us have not been able to reduce cholesterol level in our bloodstreams. <laughs> when I now heard that even the liver on its own produces cholesterol. So it's not just from vegetable oil power and all that kind of oil that you get cholesterol. The liver takes its own time and becomes a manufacturer of cholesterol. And good enough, you are in Maryland. Americans told us don't eat too much eggs, even when you can afford it. At a time again, he, they came and said, one egg a day saves your life. It makes us get confused. And today, I thank God I have had that uh, cholesterol is not too bad. They are going to come. At the same time, at the end of the day, they tell us, do all the running in okay. this country is better. We'll talk now. And I agree with that. But after some time, running doesn't help. Okay. okay. Finally, good enough, most of what he has told us today come from synthetics, molecules that have been produced. 
But I follow one particular American medical doctor who said, I eat myself into disease instead of chemical. Because even now in Nigeria, instead of buying onions that the other men carry on their barrels, women prefer to put in your rice onions in sachets, pepper in sachets, and we prefer packaged food to the onions carried on the bar. And I have decreed in my house. <laughs> Anything in sachets, don't give this man. <laughs> you can eat with your children anything you want, but give me the original. <laughs> in order to see whether I can uh, help myself by eating indigenous foods. And finally, sir, it may not be a question. Okay. Where do we go? If I come to America, I want to look for where we eat bitter leaf or hasu, apple, and the rest of them. And I hope there are people in the house that will show me where I'm in those things. Thank you very much. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> Okay, standing on existing protocol, my name is Dr. Ekaiti Sande Udo from the Department of Pharmacology, and my specialty is molecular pharmacology. Um, so, while you were explaining on the breast cancer, you made a statement that I got a bit confused, so I want clarifications on the statement. You said um, mRNA makes the oncogenes. Um, my little background on biochemistry, I know that is from the genetic pathway to the transcription and to the translation, which is the mRNA. So I was thinking it's supposed to be, I might be wrong, the oncogenes make the oncogenic mRNA. So please, I want clarification on that, sir. Then the second question I have is, uh, most of these pathways, um, the mechanism of the drug is by inhibiting most times the enzymes. And um, while teaching in class to students, whenever we try to talk about the inhibition of a molecule like an enzyme, we also talk about the side effect because most times those enzymes have beneficial effect in other parts of the body. So, in, for example, the Cytochrome 26 under the Atra Ramba model. Yeah, yeah. In trying to inhibit that because you need the retonic acid not to be broken down. What happens to the pancreas because the, that enzyme is also beneficial in the pancreas. So I'm just trying to see is there because even I remember in class we tried to say all drugs are poison. It's always the dose that makes it not poison. So that's my second question. Then my third one is not really a question. It's more like um, an advice or addition. In research, most times back here, we always start for the sciences. We always start from the in vivo to the in vitro before the clinicals or preclinicals, if you are lucky. But most times when we come for seminars like this, we are always told we should start from the in vitro to the in vivo. And um, for the young researchers, if we had to start from the in vitro, the cell lines and chips, the environment isn't, <clears throat> I don't know the word to use, but my senior <laughs> colleagues understand. So I, will, I want you, sir, to please guide us on how to break through, especially for the young researchers in the house. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Dr. Uso. I think uh, the next is from Professor Hime. Yes. Your question. Mm, I hope you are right. Yeah, I hope yes. you are getting it. Okay, all right. <laughs> because. Thank you very much, Prof, for the wonderful lecture. I happen to be your student.
in UI taught me organic chemistry. <laughs> okay. Today I'm <laughs> Professor Izila. Okay. Nice seeing you. I'm one of the greatest UIs in the hall. Okay. <laughs> greatest. Okay. One of the very greatest. If you are a, if you are like me, you can stand up and wave to prof. <laughs> Thank you very much, Prof. The drug, especially that against prostates, I wanted to find out from the pharma pharmacokinetic studies and the biotransformations in phase one, what the key enzymes you have identified and uh, moving to phase two for synthesis and excretion, what are the key metabolites that uh, your team has identified? Also let you know that we have a isolated and purified steroid saponins and their egg glycones from beta leaves. Penonia amygdalina, the, uh, the, the saponins and their egg glycones. I was a bit very surprised to see that some of the modifications that, that you carried out on the parent cholesterol resembled the egg glycones I see in what we have done, will it be possible for us to isolate and send to you to modify and see whether they may meet some of your research targets? The third thing I want to ask from you, Prof, is whether you have fairly used HPLCs UVVIS, FTI arrow, and then <laughs> even NMROs and GCMS. If you have them. <laughs> oh, I've, I've noted it. You, you say you have noted it. <laughs> I thank the, the participants. So, Prof, we request for them. Wherever they are, you can package them and send to us. <laughs> Please, with all due respect to our president, the vice chancellor of the University of Calabar, that is my request and my questions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gila. It looks like uh, some of you did not understand that last part. Uh, you did, right? Yes. Uh, <laughs> if you did not, Professor Giller is asking Professor Nzia that he is aware that every day new model of equipment comes out. And once the new model comes out, the proper one becomes obsolete that can be put together all those considered obsolete. <laughs> 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 Let's inform you. In case you don't know, if you are already doing it, they say, ask, and it shall be given. Thank you very much, Dr. Zekila. Thank you very much, Prof, for this wonderful lecture series. My name is Dr. Ivan Keta of the Department of Science Laboratory Technology. I want to commend you for this wonderful lecture series. I want to also thank the President of the University of Calabar. Oh, the Professor President. <laughs> 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 um, the President. <laughs> during the lecture series, sir, uh, from the chart, one of the charts you showed us, it, uh, that chart indicates that uh, Jamaica has the highest rate of prostate cancer cases. I want to know the predisposing factors. Are there 
environmental, genetic, or all lifestyle. Thank you very much. Okay. My question is coming from a computer science background. By God's grace, I'm currently the head computer science department. Apart from researches in molecular simulation, there is a new wave of research in artificial intelligence and machine learning. My questions to you are the following. Number one, is your lab doing anything with computer scientists using machine learning algorithms? Number two, if yes, what's your honest perception or your honest um, expectation from such researchers? Because currently, I came with a PhD student of mine who is actually doing her research in breast cancer using machine learning algorithms. And then number three, you know, having answered this soon, if they are positive, what can we do going forward from the science background, from computing as developers? to also put in our weight to solve the cancer problem. Thank you, Prof. Okay, thank you. Uh, I think uh, let's now give uh, Professor Oja an opportunity to begin to respond. Okay. Uh, you, okay. Have to, you have to read the questions yes, I because to, uh, I, I, I will not remember. I will need to read out the question, the way I have probably rephrased it. Okay. okay. I think the first question was from the Dean of Pharmacy. He said, how would you help the faculty of pharmacy, especially the Department of Pharmaceutical Chemistry? Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Okay, all right. I can sit down. Hi. Will I help the Department of Pharmacy? One of the easiest ways I think, I mean, I can help, is uh, to actually collaborate with, uh, okay, that's your faculty and the universities. So, uh, we should all think of it this way. When you want to talk about, okay, that's collaboration, collaboration, collaboration. You solve, okay, that's one of the slides, okay, that I had at the beginning of my talk, where I said, I mean, with research, you have to have Okay, that's a hypothesis. I mean, on what you really want to do. Okay, but more importantly, after, I mean, your hypothesis, and of course, I mean, you write a grand project, you need funding. So, I mean, the crucial thing about collaborations and all that would have to do with the fact that, I mean, we have to come with, I mean, some innovative way actually to, I mean, to apply for funding. You see, because it's not just you want to collaborate. Even, look at that's within the US. I mean, if any group wants to collaborate with my lab, I mean, the basis is that we will likely have funding for the projects. So we have to think in that sense. I mean, you have to apply for funding. Okay. Uh, 
Yeah. Okay, so you see, I have this slide here where I stated, okay, that if you look right up here, okay, that's IP dosing. Are you listening? Okay, that's it. Intraperitoneal dosing. So usually, I mean, that's the first, okay, route that we want to try. Okay, that's for any new molecule. Okay, because that gets into the system this much easier. However, as we know, I mean, the best way, I mean, to administer drugs is, you know, oral. So, okay, but if you just want to give, okay, that's your new molecule. Okay, okay that's the best chance. I mean, you administer it IAP. But if you look at the next slide here, okay. You see here, we compared oral administration an IP administration. And as you can see here, there's not much difference. So this typically, I mean, for any anti-cancer drug, you want to develop it to be administered, okay, orally. So in this particular case, we, we did first the IP, I mean, just to make sure, you know, we're giving the molecule the best chance. And after that, you see, I mean, we did a head-to-head -head comparison of oral and IP, and you can see we get the same thing. However, I mean, with some molecules, you might have to give them that IV. Okay, but typically, we would want in an oral, you know, drug. Thank you, bro. Thank you. Thank you, bro. I think you should sit. No, no, it's okay. I'm fine. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And, uh, the second question I think was from from Professor Sim. Professor Sim is asking that uh, he noticed you were talking about clinical trials is one, okay. clinical trials is two, and clinical trials is three. Yeah. What's what do these respective phases involve? Are there any differences? Could you just do one clinical trial? Because no. he has a compound, he wants to move into the clinical trial. Uh, all right. So, I'll get to the slides that I'm talking about. So, once, I mean, you're developing... Okay, that's molecules. And you, you now believe you have what we call, okay, that's the lead molecule. Okay, that's the best molecule you think you want to take forward. It's based, I mean, on the research. You have to show, okay, that's in animal models first, okay, that the molecules work. Then, before you go, to, I mean, to say you want to do, uh, I mean, the clinical trials, you have to do what you call an IND investigational study. Okay, what that means, okay, that's investigational, okay, that's new drug development. And that involves this mainly how this molecule okay, can be made in large scale. Okay, that's the chemistry. You also have to look out, 
how okay this molecule I mean it's stable in the shelf life all that is called okay that CMC okay that stability okay and control okay and manufacturing okay but more importantly I mean to get an IND approval okay that's you know from the FDA okay that's the Food and Drug Administration you have to do extensive toxicology studies and the toxicology studies would have to be done first in rats okay the repeated dosing I mean the 28 days dosing I mean just to make sure you know okay that's how toxic I mean your compound is okay but you don't end there you have to do I mean you have to do the toxicology studies also in dogs and in some cases they might require you to do some toxicology studies in pigs so it's only after you've done all those I mean, you now apply to the FDA, and if you get an FDA approval, I mean, all that that approval states is that, okay, that molecule is safe, I mean, to test in humans, right? I mean, so you get the IND approval. After you get the IND approval, the first Okay, clinical trial is called the phase one clinical trials. And in that phase one clinical trials, you want, okay, first, I mean, to do, okay, that's the PK, okay, pharmacokinetics in humans. You want to know the half life, okay, the volume, of, I mean, of distribution and things like that. Then, you want to make sure okay that the doses that you are planning to develop okay that's based I mean on your PK studies are safe I mean that you can do in about 20 patients usually Okay, the phase one clinical trial for most diseases is done in men who are healthy. Okay, but in cancer, either because of, uh, okay, that's the nature of the disease, you know, the phase one studies is actually done, okay, that's in cancer patients. I, I mean, so in that case, of course, you would look in that phase one okay with a small number of patients to see whether I mean the molecule is effective okay importantly also in phase one you now want you now want to determine okay that's the dose that you would use in your phase two okay, so the phase two studies I mean it's in cancer patients and it's enlarged to about about 60 or 70 patients and if of course I mean you now determine the dose there uh, you know is it uh, or efficacious you now again apply to the FDA okay that's based on the data you have and the FDA would approve okay for you to do okay that's a phase three clinical trial Okay, that's supposed to be the pivotal clinical trial before the drug is approved. And in that case, that's done in a large number. Okay, 800 patients to 1,000 patients. Okay, that's different centers, you know, all over the world, if possible, in the US, in Europe, you know, and things like that. Yes, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the phase one, 
Okay, that's few patients. And all you want to make sure is that it's a drug safe in humans. Okay, and you establish a dose. I mean, or doses you want to test in your phase two. In phase two, okay, there are many more patients. To so say it's a drug, okay, it's efficacious in the disease state. And then in phase three, then you do, okay, that's a light scale. Yeah. Okay, and you compare it, you know, for example, in phase three with an existing drug. And you want to show, okay, whether your drug is equivalent to the existing drugs or is better, I mean, than existing drugs. Thank you, bro. Does that answer your question, Usim? Absolutely. Absolutely. Usimo. <laughs> I hope you meant that that pain is only between. <laughs> between the two of <laughs> Thank you. I think the other person from, well, Professor Mami's question was born in comment. Okay. Was born in comment, but he's wondering. Mm. He's really, really wondering. When he looked at, I'm sure it was from your retinoid acid. Retinoid, and, yeah. Uh, Yes, you have all, okay, incidentally, if you're asking about, you have all foods now sold in the U.S. I mean, in most, in most cities, you have Nigerian food. Yeah. Okay, uh, the next, well, I would want to put that as a question. Uh, from uh, Dr. Kaita Udo, Okay, we know that. That's what uh, we know for many years. But the hard question is that uh, you are talking about inhibiting certain enzymes as a mechanism of action. Yeah. And these enzymes may equal be very critical to the synthesis of other biologically important biomolecules. What the cost benefit analysis of inhibiting an enzyme, which is of course useful not only to the cancer cell but other cells. Okay. So, I mean that's a good question. But what uh, you have to understand is that for every drug that you take, you might have okay what you call. You call okay that side effects. You see, but okay, but well, that's why you do the toxicology studies. If a drug, I mean, it's inhibiting okay, that's a particular enzyme. If it is okay, toxic. Okay, that's the mice. I mean, you cannot develop it. I mean, you cannot. I mean, so you have to weigh the balances of that. If I administer this particular molecule at a particular dose, I'm able, I mean, to inhibit, okay, that's the molecular target, I'm interested in. And another thing also, uh, it all boils down to Uh, to this way of thinking, I mean, with molecules, you know, most, okay, that's biologists, actually, for example, they will tell you, I mean, you have a molecule, and it's designed, I mean, to hit one target, and they expect that you give that molecule to a human or to a mice, and it would just go around and just hit that target. That's unrealistic. I mean, that's not true. And in fact, uh, hold on. Uh, oh, can you can you just get can you just take it off? Okay, PowerPoint showing. Yeah. 
I, I'm just taking it off PowerPoint sharing and they will be all. Okay, take it off from PowerPoint. <laughs> leave it on MS Word or something. I mean, just leave it, you know, showing with all the slides. Do you get what you mean? You get what I'm he saying? Them. Yeah, he does. So just leave you all on slides. Uh, I'll show you a slide. I mean, I always have a backup slide actually because I get those questions. All this. Just put all the slides showing. That is stop the the PowerPoint. Yeah, I don't know why he lost it. Only he could have just offed it from PowerPoint. Yeah, just show the slides. Showed the no, no, it's not showing them in the right mode. Show all of them on the screen. Okay, wait. No, that's no, that's not. No, it's no. You should have just put all of them showing here, and I can just scroll down. No, but this is okay. All right, don't worry. I'll soon get there. Okay, great. All right. I'll put it on PowerPoints showing. Why does it do that? Oh, come on. That particular slide, you would have just put it, you know. Yeah. Yeah, it's slide 70 something. It's really. There's a way you would have just put all of them and I would just scroll down and get it. Let's go down here and show all of, okay, go to 77. Go on. That's not no, the, no. 77. 77. Oh, this guy. Let's go to the, yeah, go, go, yeah, on. 77. Okay. Okay, all right, okay, all right, hold on, yeah. I think it's one of those. Yeah. No, not the one, the next one. No, go. No, the next one. Yeah. So, so just show a PowerPoint. Oh boy, he has come back to this. Okay, all right. All right, so, I mean, we're all familiar, I mean, with AKT, right? Who asked the question? We're all familiar with AKT, right? Okay, AKT is, what's, oh, sorry. Oh, okay, I have a mic. Uh, so, we're all familiar. Okay, with AKT. Okay, that's a molecule. And that molecule is found in all of us, in all of our bodies, right? But if you look at it, look at, okay, the interactions with all these, you know, these other molecules. And we are not dead yet. So the fact you would expect, because you are talking of just one target, Okay, that this molecule would just do one thing. It doesn't do just one thing. And if you look at also mTOR, it's another example. I mean, which is found in, in our bodies. I mean, it's interacting actually with so many things. So the point is that if you inhibit, okay, that's a target. And they are very, you know, these well-known drugs Okay, that save drugs which inhibit a particular target. I mean, they have been used, okay, that's for years, for years, and for years. If you believe that you have a molecule that is 100% safe, then 
you will not make any molecule. That's my answer. Thank you, Prof. Uh, Prof just told us something my dinner to be really helpful. That in the midst of life, there's death. Okay? Don't be afraid to die. Don't be afraid to die. <laughs> Once you're healed of cancer, treat the cancer first, and then when you survive after what, you can carry it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. And uh, well, the other things he brought up was the way we do our research. Oh, okay. Uh, you know, you talk before, yeah. we're talking from cell line, yeah. and then finally we came yeah. to mind. Here we start with rats. No, okay. So, so that's what we let me, done. let me answer that. So, I mean, it's, bet, it's better to start, I mean, with the cell lines, because the cell lines, okay, are cheaper than, okay, working with mice. So, uh, yeah, so if you, look at, if you look at, you know, my grant applications, Okay, you look at the budget that I have. Okay, that's for cell lines to do with the in vitro cell culture. I mean, they are much, they are much cheaper, okay, than the animal models. So, I mean, you should notice that in cell lines, you'll be able to tell, I mean, if your molecule or your molecules are this engaging Okay, that's the molecular target of interest. I mean, so that will give you, okay, that's the courage to now go ahead to do, okay, that's the animal studies. I mean, in mice. Say, for example, in our, in, uh, in our mice studies, I mean, you have to purchase the mice. Okay, that's from a vendor. I mean, this mice, would stay in what we call the hotel. Okay, that's the vet, I mean the vet resources area. And each day that you have, you have self mice, you are paying, because that's a per diem, I mean on the mice. So, so it's more expensive actually. But, I mean the in vivo study is so important that even if you have Okay, that's all your data, this in vitro. If you cannot show, okay, that your molecule works in mice, and it's in mice, you would know whether it's toxic. I mean, you know two things. If it's working in an animal model, and if it is safe. Yeah. Thank you. Uh... I know why everybody, uh, why they are looking the way they are. Yeah, why? Because we don't even have lights to maintain our cell lines. <laughs> okay, so, uh, uh, yeah, so, uh, uh, okay, so those are the issues then. I mean, the cell lines, of course, you have to maintain them under CO2 regulated and things like that. Well, <laughs> and indeed, in the U.S., I'm sure if it kills more than two or three mice, they will be lost. Up. We no, have uh, the uh, right uh, to kill uh, hundred rats. Yeah, yeah. Oh, uh, 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 really? Uh, uh, <laughs> well, oh, oh, okay. So, <laughs> okay. Since you are talking about that, <laughs> okay. As investigators, actually, the U.S. If you want, if you want to propose experiments in mice. You have to get okay, that's, uh, an approval. Yeah. Okay, it's the traditional, you know, IOCOC I, I approval. And that's one of the most okay, annoying things that I, that I have to deal with. Do you know that in our system, if you write, okay, that's a protocol and miss, you know, maybe and off on and they will actually return it to you to make that correction you know so it's 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 a mess but 
I mean, we have to get we have to get that approval. It's a pain, but we have to get the approval. Yes. Okay. Thank thank you, Prof. I think uh, we'll move on now to the questions from uh, I think Professor Igila. Igila wanted to know that. Uh, what were the key enzymes identified in the transformation of collecteron? And uh, what, what are the, what are its metabolites? And what are the features of those metabolites? Okay, that's a very good question. So, um, uh, one of the key enzymes in the phase one Okay, that's metabolism. I believe it is CIP. Okay, three A four, which was found, and uh, one of the metabolites is uh, okay. It's what we call the keto form of galateron. Um, I don't have the structure here, but it's the keto form. Actually, the, the Okay, as the hydroxy group at three position is oxidized to, yes, uh, I mean to a ketone, and uh, the double bond also, okay, would isomerize actually. And in some studies, actually, by other groups, I mean, that was also found to be, okay, that's effective. I mean, that's all I can say for now. Okay, thank you. I mean, there are published reports on that, and if you are interested, I mean, I can send you the references. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Uh, I think the other was more like a comment, and uh, I'm sure, like you had previously said, when the collaboration is cemented, yeah, yeah. we'll be able to know exactly what to do, because he was talking about sending some aid like this, for your laboratory to be able to investigate to see if they have any potential anti-cancer properties against uh, few cancers. Uh, that's possible. In fact, uh, uh, one of our former colle colleagues who okay has been involved with natural products. Okay, that's Okogun. I don't know whether you know him. Uh, uh, Professor Kogun. So he sent me okay, that's an extract. And incidentally, I mean he actually takes that extract for okay, that's his prostate cancer. Okay? I mean, he actually was diagnosed, you know, with prostate cancer. He takes, okay, that's some approved, okay, FDA drugs. Okay, but he also adds his herbs. So he then approached me and, and said, why not test, okay, these herbs against the prostate cancer cell lines that we had in the lab? So I had, okay, as a technician in the lab to test them, and they were quite, okay, effective. And we actually compared them actually with our own molecules and also some known drugs. So, I, um, as I speak, I mean, he actually takes them, and he says, I mean, his prostate cancer is in remission. I mean, he still takes them. I mean, he's 85 now. He's in the U.S. I mean, I actually saw him, I think, about a month ago. Okay, that's during my 70th birthday. I mean, he actually attended my 70th birthday. Okay, okay and the Roland was at my 70th birthday last month. Two months ago, sorry. <laughs> Okay, thank you. So I mean, you understand, you need to prepare your extract. Yeah, yeah. We may have a moral anti-cancer agent. Yeah. Okay, thank you. 
Okay, now to the question from uh, Dr. Yvonne. Yvonne uh, noticed that from one of the slides that Jamaica had the highest incidence of growth. Okay, of okay, all right. And is wondering whether there are environmental, genetic, or other factors that are responsible for. Yeah, so um, that's an interesting question, and I read, I mean, I read an article, okay, that's a couple of months ago, and it was, uh, it was being said that it's because of, okay, that's what, Okay, that's what you might call the high level, I mean, of androgens in, okay, that's people in that area of the world. Okay, that's in the Caribbeans. Okay, and they try to trace it back. Okay, that's the slavery where, uh, Okay, that's the people were under, okay, that's a lot of stress. And when you are under a lot of stress, I mean, you produce a lot of these hormonal compounds, okay, okay, like cortisol and all those. And those, you know, do impact on the levels, you know, of androgens. And it's believed Okay, that, that's a major reason, I mean, for why, okay, that prostate cancer is at high. So you can equate it, okay, that's to the levels of, of the male sex hormones, I mean, which, I mean, was caused actually from the slavery, um, okay, episode. I mean, that was what I read. And, um, okay, and to my mind, it does make some sense. Yeah. Thank you, Mark. Yeah. 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 Okay, uh, finally, we have one question from uh, A to B of the Sand. Yeah. Uh, wanting to know if your laboratory is doing anything using machine learning. Okay. The machine learning algorithm. Are they doing anything using machine learning? And what is your, what is your view going forward? about machine learning and developing the Okay, all right. Uh, I mean, that's a very good question. Okay, well, several years ago, I was actually, con you know, this convinced, okay, by former students, I mean, in UI, I mean, who was working now in one of these companies, I mean, that was selling, okay, this molecular modeling, you okay, software. You okay, so how did I meet these students? Okay, this for my students. I think I was out uh, at a conference, I mean, in New Orleans. Okay, and I was just walking around, okay, that's the ACS conference. Okay, and I saw, okay, that's a crowd, you know, is listening, I mean, to some demonstration, I mean, of molecular modeling software, okay, that's for drug discovery. So, uh, so when I made my way, okay, that's to listen, I mean, to this, uh, I mean, this person that was, you know, so enthusiastic and discussing about, okay, that drug discovery and developing molecular modeling. I mean, so this person stopped speaking. And the next thing he said, that was my professor in Ibadan. You know, okay, and from there, he was now able to convince me to buy Okay, one of the, this, um, okay, this software modeling thing. Okay, that's from my lab. I mean, he even came to my, I mean, to my lab to train the postdocs and all that. 
Okay, but however, uh, I actually use this modeling things for, I mean, for, for about 10 years and all of that. I mean, there are other groups, I mean, in my university, okay, that have a big center for molecular modeling and all of that. You know, but to us, okay, that's medicinal chemists and organic chemists. I mean, we, I mean, we typically say, okay, that those molecular modeling equipments are, okay, fancy. Okay, and the reason I say that, for example, if you come, okay, that's to my university. I mean, there's a center, okay, that's for, okay, that's for drug discovery, which all they do, uh, okay, it's AI, I mean, it's computers and all that. Okay, but all these groups, I mean, they have not been able to advance Okay, that's one molecule into the clinic. I mean, so I tease them that, well, I've been able to advance molecules into the clinics without using, you know, the AI stuff and all that. Usually with the AI, I mean, when they show the structures and all that, the crystal structures, they tell you, okay, the molecule, is, it all looks fancy to me. And most cases, uh, when they now come up and say, okay, this is a molecule, okay, that fits the different, this molecular, you know, stuff and all that. Okay, the last one I will tell you, I mean, they came out with a molecule, I mean, with the predicted, would inhibit the, the target, okay, by this nanomolar, whatever. Or we now synthesize this molecule. And then when we tested it in cell culture, it was not effective. So, I mean, although a few groups have used it, but I still just go by what, by what I call my medicinal chemistry, oncopharmacology, ingenuity, or instincts. You know, because these are real examples now, so I'm not giving Okay, that's an example that I don't know about. As far as I know, okay, my lab, okay, at the University of Maryland, is the only lab, I, I mean, that advanced, that advanced a molecule that was developed, I mean, from the laboratory at the University of Maryland, which has advanced, okay, that's your phase three clinical trials. I mean, I do not know of any other. And as you saw, I mean, we have a phase two clinical trials going on, okay, that's in pancreatic cancer. And we, I mean, the Ramba molecules, we are hoping, I will soon initiate another clinical trial, okay, that's in triple negative breast cancer and things like that. Thank you, bro. Uh, thank you. Uh, Oh, I'll be glad to connect you actually with groups, okay, that do, okay, that's computer, okay, molecular modeling. Thank you very much. Yeah. Yes. I think uh, you agree with me that uh, the Professor Vincent Injan, a Okay. Uh, some <laughs> to all the Christians we do before me. No, no, we, no, no. We strongly believe that there is some collaboration, there's some waiting for. It may be that they had an error in making that molecule. Maybe one keto group was already related. Or the three quarter program was looked at the five seats. And we have a response to them. So don't worry, keep trying. I'm sure you will get there. Bro, thank you very much. Yeah. But the very last. On the question, I didn't put it up. It was a third question raised by Professor Nikina. 
Madam President, they are giving they are giving you a new name, a new title. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. <laughs> you have a new.
millions of people. You see, not children, not ladies, dying of breast cancer. You see, young men at their forties suffering from bullshit, rendering them ineffective, even in handling their homes. You can see what is happening. So these issues are very necessary at this time for us to understand and handle them. Dear Professor, your thought-provoking lecture has undoubtedly enriched our intellectual horizon. I want to express our profound thanks to the Vice Chancellor and the university for providing a platform such as this for intellectual discourse and fostering an environment for academic excellence. My special thanks again goes to the organizing committee. At a very short time, they have been able to put this event together. When we came in the morning, we thought people would not come. Very few of us, especially professors that were gathered outside, lamenting why colleagues are not attending to such events. But suddenly we see Mammon crowd coming to great this occasion. I saw them, some have left. So we thank the committee who have put this event together and we have seen that there is a great success. To all of us who have attended this function, uh, as I was sitting down there, I, from time to time, looked behind. All of us were very attentive I saw you people, you are very attentive and uh, listening to the guest lecturer. Your participation has made this gathering truly meaningful and especially on the question and answer session which you have put forward to the guest lecturer and he was able to throw more light even into I got so much from the answer that he gave. We are also grateful to our sponsor, again, the Vice Chancellor and the Management Investor of Calabar and partners. I don't know who are the partners, but I know that they must be partners. <laughs> who have supported and have been instrumental in bringing this event to fiction. As we leave this place, as we leave this place with this seed of wisdom planted by our today's lecturer, lecture, let's continue to nurture. Let's continue to nurture this culture of learning and scholarly dialogue. Very necessary and important for our university uh, to be considered and ranked among the top war university in the world. Let me just opportunity to thank all of you for being part of this enriching experience and uh, I pray that the Advanced Chancellor will continue with this opportunity from time to time throughout 2024 and the period I will be chairman and committee of this so that should be benefiting from this. <laughs> God bless all of you and safely the guest center in Jesus' name. Thank you so much. Can we be seated at yeah. Thank you. The graduate coming to the cruise is now time to invite a dear vice chancellor to please step forward and give us closing. Our very distinguished 
indigenous term and the Dalim wife, very distinguished academics, our friends, visitors, our students. I want to thank again the guest lecturer for accepting to give us this thought-provoking lecture today. From your questions, like the chairman of the team said, from your question asked, I have no doubt that we were quite happy and appreciate that we learned a lot about this. And um, I want to thank our colleagues really for coming out. This time, the times we are here, we are going to have many more of this. We just started while this thing is here. Please, if you have friends who are willing to share their knowledge in any field with us, please, let's have their names. We bring people from across the world, Nigeria and everywhere to come talk to us. We will not just be waiting until we have a convocation lecture. I know that is more political. This is really more academic. So we really need to, to see how we run with our uh, distinguished guest uh, uh, lecture series. So I'm very happy about this. And also knowing here that Professor Nja gave one lecture at uh, this many years back during Professor Jesus' time. It's here again to give. We really, really appreciate it. And the um, DBC research and director of research, who unfortunately is not here, I appreciate it all for putting this together. And uh, I won't forget to appreciate our own Professor Norma And um, we really thank you for facilitating this and uh, really talk with your friend. You are set to talk to us in just uh, three or four days' notice. So we are really benefited. And I hope our information unit will let others know that we had this lecture before Ibadan. We will go and have a hope that the first beneficiary is not being high. So, <laughs> so thank you very much, my dear principal officers. Thank you for sitting. Okay, it's a different lecture. Okay, okay, thank you for sitting tight. Thank you, everybody. And please, let's always come back whenever you are invited for lectures like this. God bless each and every one. I think that clap was for me. Can we now clap for the vice chancellor? Thank you so much. Everything that has a beginning must have an end. We have come to the end of the first lecture series in the year 2024. On this note, can we please rise as I invite Professor Luisa Uwans to please lead us in the closing prayer. Please rise. Thank you so much.
instruct your brothers, this works on your recipe, you continue to go. Thank you, I thank God and my God for the ones that are here to listen. That I don't have more in power, that I don't have change in mind and attitude. And I pray that they lose the knowledge they have acquired here, very meaningfully, that they will have pain, that they will not hear. Thank you, Lord, for holding me. Yes, I hope it is.